Well, first of all, thank you for having me here, particularly to Amir and Zave. Um, so this topic, as we all know, is so complicated and or toxic and or hyperbolic and or all kinds of negative emotions that my real goal today is to conduct this conversation in such a way as to uh, inspire or catalyze greater curiosity on the part of every one of you about this topic. And I say that because uh, I've recently been rereading two books. My first degree was in history, so I'm kind of a history buff. Rereading two books. One was, one is Barbara Tuckman's Guns of August, for which she won the, won the Pulitzer in 1962. And the other was Richard Hofstetter's the paranoid style in American politics. The first book, Tuckman's first book, of course, is How We Got Ourselves into World War I Rather by Accident, unfortunately. The second book, Hofstetter's book, is even in some ways more relevant. Hofstetter's book, he was inspired to write the book because of the uh, emergence of Joe McCarthy. And he wanted to understand how is it possible that Joe McCarthy could have arisen in this country. And so he went back through history and came all the way to the present, and he basically concluded, I'm simplifying, but bear with me here, uh, he basically concluded there's kind of a paranoid gene in our culture that surfaces every so often, typically in conditions in which ordinary people have got difficult lives, and a populist leader comes along and inflames their fears and their passions and their, and their insecurities by reference to some external malevolent force called communism, or terrorism, or Chinese. And we're living through one of those periods right now. And what Hofstetter basically says is, this is just part of who we are. And it kind of ebbs and flows, and every so often it surfaces, and then it disappears. But when it surfaces, it hangs around for a while. It's a decade or two. This is not something that disappears quickly. And what's amazing is that this pattern continues to exist. <laughs> I mean, it just drives me nuts, but anyway. so. <clears throat> So Hofstetter would say that when it, when, it, when it occurs, first of all, it's going to last for a while. Second of all, people who know better typically do one of two things. They go to ground and disappear and say nothing, which is not very helpful. Or worse, they get to the front of the queue and they lead the parade. And again, we're seeing a lot of that right now. That's why I, I start off by saying, I have this kind of naive hope that, that commonsensical, ordinary, intelligent Americans can analyze things themselves and come to uh, more balanced conclusions than what's going on in our country right now on this topic. You know, it wasn't very long ago, essentially the consensus was all over on this side of the ship, now suddenly it's over on the other side of the ship. And, you know, you get a little bit of vertigo watching this happen. So. Uh, that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is uh, I've kind of been trying my mind, how do I discuss this topic in a way that gets oxygen into the room and people will actually listen? And so I started to, to uh, say to myself, well, maybe I should talk about the world in the future because people are less emotional about that. It's for more distance. It'll be more balanced. But near enough that it's real. So I started as fashion on the year 2050. And I said to myself, OK, well, what will the world be like in 2050? Well, the best estimates are there'll be something like 10 billion people. And today, there are approximately 8 billion. So we have an incremental 2 billion people. And those people are going to come primarily from nine countries. And those countries are India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Indonesia, the United States. So essentially, we're going to add 2 billion poor people, primarily in Africa and Central Asia. And at the same time, the concentration of wealth will get worse. So for example, the US and China today are something like 42% of global GDP. 
in the year 2050, no one really knows, of course, but it's going to be somewhere between 50 and 60 percent. So two countries will have 50 or 60 percent of the world's wealth, and there'll be two billion more poor people. Now, we already know what it looks like when you have that kind of uh, inequality, both within countries and across countries. Just about everything you can think about is not good. Migration, disease, terrorism, climate change, etc. So I look at that and I say to myself, if we had any kind of, as it were, strategic planning going on for the world, raise your hand if you think it's a good idea that in that world I just described, that the world's, pick your number, most powerful, wealthiest, 10 countries, five countries, or how about the two countries? Who thinks it's a good idea that in that world, those two countries should spend most of their time fighting with each other? It, I mean, it can't make any sense at all. And so I look at that world and I say to myself, well, wait a minute. Right now, the way I feel about it, it's like we're heading over a cliff. We're, per we're persuading ourselves, and it's kind of, it's kind of like an uh, escalating negative game. Both sides are persu persuading themselves that the other one's uh, nefarious, malevolent, and it's getting worse and worse, and it can't make any sense. And so then I scratch my head and say, well, now how are we going to get ourselves out of, this trap, out, of, out of this trap? And it's not obvious, particularly when you have regard to what I said a minute ago about Hofstetter, because our own country domestically is going to be, in my opinion, politically ill for a while. So with that, if I can call it that reality, that makes the, 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 the task that much more difficult. So there are only two things I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm hoping will exist. One is that other countries will in fact increasingly over time, more forcefully, say to the United States and China, I'm sorry, it's simply not acceptable for the two of you not to have a constructive relationship. The world cannot exist if that's the case, and you've got to stop it. Um, and you see some of that happening right now. One of the things that, that kind of interests me, it's a, I don't want to take a tangent, but I'll just quickly go through this. If you look at the, um, the Russian-Ukrainian war, and if you were following just the English language media, English language communication channels, which dominate the world's communication channels, you could be forgiven for thinking that the sanctions on Russia are basically a good idea and are essentially working. And most people see it that way. Until you get into the fine print and you realize that of the 54 African countries, the number supporting the sanctions is zero. Of the 32 Latin American countries, the number supporting the sanctions is zero. Of the 22 Middle Eastern countries, the number supporting the sanctions is zero. The 48 Asian countries, number supporting the sanctions are three. South Korea, Japan, Singapore. 16 Pacific Island countries, two. Australia and New Zealand. So I just named you 175 countries, five of which are supporting the sanctions. So the sanctions are essentially an American, Western European, and a few American allies, in essentially in Asia and Australasia. Now, the relevance of that is that it does show you a, a certain kind of fissure that exists that you don't hear a lot about. Uh, and the positive side of which may be, this is the question, may be, that all those other countries over time will say to both the United States and China, as I said earlier, it's just not acceptable for you all not to have a, a decent relationship. And, and China, by the way, is already the largest trading partner with 140 of those countries. Uh, and China, I was just in China uh, earlier this week, listening to a, uh, there's a new sort of, well, a more, a more prominent form of a term of art the Chinese are using called Chinese modernization. And they're determined to illustrate to the world that modernization and westernization are not synonymous. And that modernization can take different forms in different countries. And I was listening to the foreign minister lay all this out, and among the other things he cited was, in no particular order, uh, 
China has contributed more to global growth in the last decade than all G7 countries put together. 1.4 billion people in China are more than all the developed world put together. Uh, they're, they're the leading trader with 140 countries. Uh, the trade between China and ASEAN, this is amazing, the trade between China and ASEAN is bigger than the trade between the United States and EU. So when you start going down through these things, you realize there's a certain reality here that sooner or later uh, the Americans are going to have to accept. And my own opinion is the sooner that, that gets understood and accepted, the better, and that the relationship has got to get better, because if it doesn't get better, then everything I was saying about 2050, let alone 2070 or 2100, is just going off a cliff.